Next, almost 3,000 incidents of anti-Semitic behavior were found in 2021 throughout the United States. It's the highest number on record in over 40 years. Deborah Lipstadt is professor of modern Jewish history and Holocaust studies at Emory University. And she's the newly appointed special envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism for the Biden administration. In 2000, she famously defeated Holocaust denier David Irving in a libel suit in the British High Court. And she joins Walter Isaacson to discuss the rise and the pervasive nature of these attacks. And this interview is part of Exploring Hate, our ongoing series on anti-Semitism, racism, and extremism. Thank you, Christian and Ambassador Lipset. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. You're now the special envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. That used to be something that was exclusively something we did abroad. To what extent now are you having to focus domestically on this problem? Well, I am at the State Department, which means my remit is outside the boundaries of the United States. So that's officially, and, and that's where I will spend most of my energies, but it's getting harder and harder to make that division. If you remember back in January in Coleysville, Texas, uh, the terrorists came and held four people in the synagogue hostage for about 12 hours till they miraculously escaped. He had came here from England he was from the Middle East, but he came here from England and uh, was radicalized to some extent in a mosque in England. So, and then he came to the United States, was here three days and committed his act. So officially it was domestic terrorism, but you can't separate from what he got abroad. So though most of my work will be abroad, I'm very conscious of the interconnectedness of what's going on. Explain that interconnectedness of sort of the anti-Semitism that's welling up abroad, the terrorism that comes and people getting radicalized like what happened in Coleyville and how it plays in to both the anti-Semitism and the radicalism here in the United States. It's, I'm glad you phrased it that way. I'm not surprised you phrased it that way because it's really uh, an interlocking whole. Uh, each prejudice, the, rad the radicalism, whether it's white supremacy or another form of, rad of prejudice has its distinct characteristics. Anti-Semitism has its unique characteristics and it's ubiquitous, it's free flowing. It comes from every place on the political spectrum. It comes from Christians, it comes from Muslims, it comes from even Jews. Um, if you add to that what we're seeing today in the growth of conspiracy theories, not just in this country, but abroad too, whether it's about COVID, whether it's about elections, whether it's about finances, whatever it might be. Anti-Semitism has this unique characteristic, unlike most other prejudices, of being at its heart a conspiracy theory. The idea is Jews control the media, Jews control the banks, Jews control the government, Jews control culture, whatever it might be, um, so that the anti-Semite begins, if he's looking for, or she's looking for someone who caused COVID, she's sure it's the Jews and she just has to find the connection. If she's not an anti-Semite to begin with, but she's sure that there's a conspiracy behind COVID, well, she has to find someone with the power, with the evil characteristics, who's conniving enough, who's clever enough to be doing this, and she ends up at the Jew. So the Jew becomes a very convenient scapegoat when you've got conspiracy theories. And we're living in this day and age of conspiracy theory. So that's one point, I think, to answer your interconnectedness. The other point is we're seeing tremendous movements of populations uh, from Africa, from uh, South America, Latin America, from Muslim countries into countries that think of themselves or a portion of their population thinks of themselves as white Christian countries. Um, and you've had this, you have this uh, great replacement theory, which is not something new, but which has gotten added mileage in the past uh, five, six years, something like that, uh, which claims that there is a, a organized effort, a conspiracy afoot to replace white Christian culture, white Christian hegemony, um, and replace, pe replace it with Muslims, with with people of color, black people, people from Africa, and 
But says the person who subscribes to this, this absurd theory, these people, black people, people of color, Muslims, they're not smart enough. And this is gonna sound familiar from what I just said before, wealthy enough, powerful enough, evil enough, and sneaky enough to be doing this behind closed doors so they don't get caught, but they're the puppeteers and they end up at the Jew. If you look at the uh, Buffalo, the, the terrible tragedy in Buffalo uh, last month where uh, this man went looking for a neighborhood to kill as many black people as he could. If you read his so-called manifesto, it's 180 pages. I, I urge your, your uh, viewers not to read it. I did it already, I saved you the trouble. It's horrible. It's filled with racist diatribes, but linked together is anti-Semitic diatribes. And they're not separate. It's not that he hates blacks and he hates Jews, but he sees uh, blacks proliferating. He sees them uh, you know, uh, being in the White House. He sees them gaining influence and there must be some who's behind them, who's manipulating them. It's the Jew. So. When I'm fighting anti-Semitism or combating, trying to combat, trying to educate about it, not only do I see the linkage between domestic and international, but I also see the linkage with other prejudices that you can't, you can't fight hate in a silo. You've said that at the root of anti-Semitism globally, historically, and in the United States is a conspiracy uh, theory, this notion that there's some dark conspiracy. We've always had conspiracy theories for hundreds of years. What seems different now is that they can get amplified and spread through social media. How much are you focused on that? Very, very much so. I'll be meeting in the next few days uh, with counterparts from Europe who also are, uh, who have similar portfolios uh, from the EU, from Germany, uh, England, and they're all very concerned about it. You know, Walter, when I first started to study Holocaust denial, most people thought I was crazy to spend my time doing that. Uh, sadly, I was not, <laughs> it was prescient. Um, but people, but if I wanted to find denial materials, I had to order them, I didn't because there were people who archived them, but if you wanted denial material, you ordered them and you got them in a plain envelope, maybe to a PO box from a PO box because nobody wanted to be able to be tracked. Today, all you have to go is to Mrs. Google, as I like to call her, and, and or whatever your browser is, and put in a, with a few keystrokes, you get anything you want. So. You know, I don't want to beat up on social media. I use social media in my research. I use it in my writing. I use it in my job now. Um, but social media is like a knife. A knife in the hands of a killer can do terrible, terrible damage. A knife in the hands of a surgeon can save your life. It's how we use it. Do you worry that the, with midterm elections and the partisanship and the polarization we're having, that people are going to uh, here and around the world and elections around the world stoke up anti-Semitism? Yes, absolutely. It's a terrific tool that some people will use and use freely and use enthusiastically and then engage in what I call the Miss Piggy defense. Moi? Me? An anti-Semite? No, not at all. Uh, but we see it. We see it. I was an expert witness in the Charlottesville civil suit, the suit brought against the groups that uh, conducted the Unite the Right rally in the summer of 2017. So I read all their exchanges, their emails, their uh, 4chans, 8chans, whatever, all the different exchanges. And these were people who came poised to do violence and who were compelled by deep-seated racism and deep-seated anti-Semitism, and thirdly, a deep-seated commitment to violence. Uh, I think these midterm elections may be amongst the most crucial our country has faced because of that, not because of one party or the other, but because there is this growing um, radicalization. And you know, you see it, you see it all over. We're seeing it more from the and more overtly from the right now, but but I think we have to be careful wherever it comes. When I was before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee for my hearing, 
I describe myself as an equal opportunity fighter of anti-Semitism. I don't care where it comes from. I'm going to fight it. What did Charlottesville and your involvement there teach you about the connection between anti-Semitism and racism? Um, it taught me that the two are interconnected. It showed it to me so graphically. If you look at what these people were saying to one another, if you looked at the symbols they brought. Now, it's very interesting. If you looked at their flags and their shields and their banners, there were virtually no swastikas. But uh, the one who understood saw, and who knows, and as I am, I saw loads of Nazi symbols was something called the black sun, uh, different, different symbols, which were symbols that were relied on by the Nazi party, maybe not created by them, but relied on by them. Uh, I saw overt racism and I saw overt anti-Semitism. I saw how these two, for these haters, these are not two separate hatreds. These are uh, firmly intertwined, they're linked. And if we're gonna fight one, we've got to recognize this. So you're in the State Department, mainly dealing overseas. Let me ask you about a complex question, which is Ukraine, which has a Jewish president who's become a global hero. And yet the Russians are saying they're trying to denazify Ukraine. And to some extent, uh, anti-Semitism seems to be an undercurrent in a lot of these discussions. Explain right. your thinking there. Barely an undercurrent. I think what we've seen from the leadership of the Kremlin, from Putin, from Lavrov, and the foreign minister, and from others uh, in the leadership, is, first of all, the weaponization of the Holocaust, the weaponization of Nazism. To call Ukrainians Nazis, and we're out to defeat Nazis, they're right-wingers in that government, and there were people who, were, who, I, who I certainly disagree with and don't approve of, but to describe them as Nazis, is to weaponize the, the imagery of, of World War II. And then it went even further with the foreign minister making this absurd claim that Hitler's mother was Jewish. And people called me up and said, what is that? Why is it? First of all, it's absurd. Second of all, why is he making it? Hitler's mother was not Jewish. Absolutely not. But what he was saying is Hitler's mother was Jewish, i.e. Hitler was Jewish. And whatever bad things happened in the Holocaust, the Jews did to themselves. And it's a form of Holocaust, it's what I call soft core Holocaust denial. It's not denial of the facts, but it's distortion. It's turning things on their head. And it's saying you're turning the victims into the perpetrators. They may be victims, but they're also perpetrators. It was deeply, deeply anti-Semitic. And it's absurd, but uh, it seems that uh, Putin and those around him thought that it would find a, uh, an audience, if not outside Russia, certainly inside Russia. You said you're about to go meet with your cohorts and counterparts, especially, I assume, in Europe. Tell me about those meetings, whether there's a group of people like yourself in each country that take on anti-Semitism? And are you going to prioritize certain actions to do next? Well, um, the, the, here's some good news. And you, rarely when you're talking about anti-Semitism or prejudice is there good news. Increasing numbers of countries, Germany, France, the EU, even the OAS has, has, uh, has appointed someone, have appointed special envoys similar to this position. And they haven't done it because the massive Jewish population in their midst or in, they've done it because they begin to understand that this is a serious problem. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're going to talk about, we're going to see what, what, what's worked and what hasn't worked. Uh, in Europe, you've had, and certainly in England and other countries in Germany, uh, problems with sports clubs, with soccer clubs. We all face the, the online anti-Semitism. But there's another place where I'm going to be focusing my energies. And there's also good news, and that's the Abraham Accord countries, that um, in the Gulf, and possibly in other countries, both in the Gulf and Muslim, Muslim majority countries in other places, there's an increased interest and willingness to address the issue of anti-Semitism. You know, irrespective of their particular position on uh, tensions in the Middle East, on the uh, Arab-Israeli, Israeli-Palestinian issue, uh, they're beginning to realize that this is not something that is healthy for them, that this is not something that they should be exporting to the rest of the world.
You talk about working with the countries and the Gulf states and the Middle East who are part of the Abraham Accords. Explain to us what that is and why you, you feel it's promising. About three years ago during the Trump administration, um, the uh, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Morocco signed on to something they called the Abraham Accords, which and uh, signed on with Israel, the United States. Uh, there have been uh, tripartite working groups on religious freedom in these countries to say, you know what, it's time to rethink the hatred. It's time to rethink the differences. That doesn't mean that you know, they, they said we're not we're going to forget about political differences or political objectives, but there's been a hatred, there's been a division um, that just isn't, isn't in anyone's benefit. No one expected it. No one foresaw it. Uh, there had been all sorts of con uh, contacts between UAE and Israelis on commercial and other things quietly, but no one expected it to be as public. And if you had told me, you know, even 10 months ago that I would be heading out to that region to be welcomed there to talk about anti-Semitism, I wouldn't have believed it. You talk about going around the world to talk about anti-Semitism, but is there a difficulty delivering that message when more than half of bias crimes in our own country, in the United States, are anti-Semitic or against Jews? You know, I uh, during uh, in the 30s and in in, in even the late 30s, um, and when there was a debate in 1936 about having the Olympics in Berlin, there were people who said, oh, we Americans, we can't protest what's going on in Germany because we have problems in our country. I take a different attitude. I go to them. I go to them in humility. I say our country is not perfect. Our country has many problems and many issues, has long had them is trying to address them, sometimes with more vigor, sometimes with less. Um, but that doesn't stop us from saying, you've got to do it too. I don't come to them and say, oh, I'm pure as, you know, free from any wrong, I'm pure as the driven snow. We've got problems here. Um, and I think we are trying to address them, um, sometimes with more success, sometimes with less success. Uh, but that doesn't mean we have to, you know, first fix everything here and then only talk and then go talk to those abroad. But I go with a deep sense of humility that uh, I'm not coming to you from a perfect place. Ambassador Deborah Lipset, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me.